Alrighty, folks, hello and welcome back to Math 3108. Up to now, we have covered some basic properties of what we can do with integers. We've talked about modular arithmetic. And lastly, we've talked about one application of modular arithmetic, which is the RSA encryption. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to one of the most fundamental objects that we're going to be talking about throughout this course. Uh, one of the three of them, of course. And that is we're going to be dealing with an introduction to groups. To get an idea of what a group is all about, let's start by looking at something that we should all be very familiar with back from linear algebra, and that is a vector space. So typically, this is how we would define a vector space. Let V be a set on which two operations, this is typically defined as vector addition and scalar multiplication, are defined. If the listed axioms are satisfied for every u, v, and w inside of v, so u, v, and w are all vectors inside of the set v, and every scalar, which for, for us in the classes that we've taken up to this point in time are typically real numbers or they're complex numbers, so we'll let um, every scalar c and d, um, then v is called a vector space. So we have properties, or we have five axioms under the addition and five under scalar multiplication. So under addition, the first property that we have is that if I take any two vectors and I add them together, it's still a vector. So this is what's known as closure under addition. So I can take two things in my set, add them together, it's still something inside of there. The next I have is the um, commutative property. So the commutative property says if I take a vector u and v and I add them together, I get to exactly the same spot if I take v and then add that to u. Now we also have the associative property. So here I'm dealing with three vectors, u, v, and w. So on my left hand side, if I take u and v, or sorry, v and w, add them together, then add u to it, I'm again going to end up in exactly the same place. Uh, if I'm thinking of this as vectors in Rn, which we're more familiar with, we're gonna end up in exactly the same place as if I take u and v and add them together and then add w. The last two, there's always this vector zero, such that when I add zero to any other vector, it doesn't change that vector whatsoever. So think of this in terms of real numbers. If I add zero to any real number, I haven't changed what that number is. And last but not least, for every vector u, there was another vector negative u that basically undoes what we've done. So if u is how we get from the origin to the tip of u, Negative u is how we undo that. So that's our five for addition. Then for scalar multiplication, we have another five. So if I have a scalar and a vector and I multiply those two together, I'm still going to get a vector in the end. The next two properties have a distributive property. It's what links uh, the addition and the multiplication together. So if I have a scalar c and two vectors u and v, if I add those two vectors together, then scale them, I end up in exactly the same place as if I scale each vector individually and then add them together. And if I have two scalars and a single vector, I can add the two scalars together, then scale the vector, or I can scale the, the vector independently by those two scalars and then add the resulting two vectors together and again, end up in exactly the same spot. Now we also have an associativity property with the scalar multiplication. So if I have again, two scalars and a vector u, I can scale u by d and then scale it by c. And this is exactly the same as if I were to multiply the two scalars together and that resulted then multiplied that or scaled that by u. And last but not least, we have this identity property that if I take one and I multiply it by u, I still end up with u. Think of this as the same as that u plus zero. It doesn't change anything. So if I'm thinking of real numbers or if I'm thinking about integers, if I multiply any real number or any integer by one, it stays exactly the same. There is no change in it. So these are the typical axioms that we would be dealing with in, um, in linear algebra. This is what defines a, a vector space for us. Now, the more advanced we go in this topic, a slight change to this definition does in fact happen. First, let F be a field, which again, we'll define a field later because I said we're going to be getting into rings and fields soon enough. A vector space over F, over a field, 
is an additive abelian group, which again, we'll define what that is very, very shortly. That additive abelian group is our, our group V or our set V equipped with a scalar multiplication such that, again, if I take any scalars C and D in my field F and any vectors U and V in my set V, then I have exactly those uh, same 10 axioms here. So instead of just saying everything is in this, this set V, it's actually two sets. One being a set of scalars, that scalars have a specific property, they come from a field. And again, we'll define what that means in just a couple of weeks here. But then the, the group of vectors that we have, this is, in, uh, this is an abelian group, which as I said, I will define that in, in just a few slides here. So an example of this sort of an idea, again, of things that we've seen in the past, Suppose we have R2 over R. Now, typically in, say, an 1107 or 1104, if you've taken the linear algebra courses here, you would just see this written as R2. R2 is that vector space, and we're doing all our scaling by real numbers. But in reality, again, it is those two different sets. And why, why, I, want to, um, why I want to deal with these as two independent sets is because the first set, that first set of vectors that has all the properties plus a little bit more to what is going to define a group. So jumping over to my workspace here. So R2, our set of vectors, this is everything in R2. These look like everything of the form. We'll say an A sub 1, A sub 2, such that A1 and A2 are elements of the real numbers. So my whatever my x coordinate is, whatever my y coordinate is, I have choices between negative infinity up to positive infinity for the x, negative infinity to positive infinity for the y. So this is my set of, of vectors, and if we think of everything that we can do with them, well, if I have any two vectors of this form, so let's say I had my vector uh, v in R2, so this is going to be some v1, v2, and I have a u, which will be some u1, u2. If I take v plus u, so if I add them together, remember when we're adding vectors together, what we're doing is we're taking each of the components and adding them together. So my x component adding those, my y components adding those. So my x components are v1 and u1. So we add these together. And for my y components, that's a v2 and a u2. Add these two together. Now remember that V1, V2, U1, U2, these are all real numbers. So the addition of any two real numbers is still going to be a real number. So V1 plus U1 is going to be a real number. And V2 plus U2 is going to be a real number. So my X coordinate, my Y coordinate, those are perfectly legal. So this would still be an element in R2. So it's closed under addition, vector addition. Um, there is also the, the property or the uh, commutative property. So that is my V plus U is equal to U plus V. Well, we have V plus U up here. If I do U plus V, or sorry, V plus, U, or no, U plus V, yep. This is just going to be the flipped order of this. So this is u1 plus v1 now. And this is u2 plus v2. But we know with addition in real numbers, it doesn't matter which order I'm adding them in. So if I add v1 first, then u1, or u1 first, then v1, it doesn't matter. I'm going to get exactly the same real number in the end. So yes, the commutative property of this does in fact hold true. Um, same with the associativity property. I'm not going to go through and show all of these ones because, again, this is all just basic properties of real numbers. They will all work because all of this is done component-wise. Uh, the zero vector, or the zero uh, additive, so V plus zero. This is simply just V1, V2. That's my vector V plus my zero vector, which, again, still gets me back my V1, V2 when I add things component-wise. And my V plus negative v being able to undo this this is just my v1 v2 plus 
negative v1, negative v2. Which will get me, well, v1 minus v1 is going to give me a zero. v2 minus v2, well, that's going to get me zero. So I'm always going to be able to get back to the origin, regardless of how I started with this. And if I'm looking to scale any of these, I have my other set, which is going to be my real numbers. So this is any element. So A, where A, I shouldn't use A, we'll call this M, where M is a real number. So I can do my scaling in exactly the same way. So if I scale M by V, I'm doing this component by component. So M times V1, M times V2. M is a real number, V1 is a real number, V2 is a real number. So this product here will be a real number, this product here will be a real number. So this is still inside of R. And again, you can go through and you can verify that the rest of the conditions still hold. All of this is based upon the original assumptions of um, real numbers. Now, why are we starting this way? Well, we're starting this way for this very specific reason. Let's go back to the slides here. So if I think about a, a group, I can start off with the idea of a vector space that has all of this structure to it, and I'm going to start removing some of the structure here. So let's remove a couple of things. I'll scratch them out. Let's grab the pen here. So let's scratch out the idea of the scalar multiplication, where this we have this other set that we're using for scaling. So I don't need this right now. And when we're defining a group, we need most of what's happening here under addition, except for this commutative property. If it does have that property, well, that's going to help us define what an abelian group is, but it's not necessary right now. So if we take away five on the right hand side from the scalar multiplication, one away from the addition, I have four out of the 10 properties left. And this four out of the 10 is what is going to define a group for us. So again, we're starting off with all this structure and we're bringing it down into these ideas, again, of things that we already know about. So let's go into more detail in the next video. We'll see you then.